Modern day weddings can bring about a mixed bag of emotions. For some people, they can never attend enough weddings as they excitedly look forward to the romanticism, the pageantry, the fash fashion, the decorations, and for some, the meal to follow. And yet for others, to receive a wedding invitation in the mail might be likened to getting a notification of a forthcoming tax audit. These people's minds are generally focused upon not participating in their friends' public exchange of the vows, but the travel associated with attending the wedding, accommodation costs should they need to stay overnight, the expense of a gift, and the possibility of sitting down for a meal at a table with complete strangers as others get up and sheepishly present awkward speeches. This morning, as we continue with our summer sermon series, focusing upon a number of Christ's parables found within the Gospels, we're going to look at how a number of people responded to an invitation of not just any wedding, but a royal wedding. But before we do so today, let's open up this time of study in prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, for those that are able to gather online, that we could open your word and read of the deep, rich truths of the scriptures. And Lord, we pray today that in this challenging parable, Lord, that you would shed some light on its meaning, that you would offer to us clarity so we can understand what you are trying to communicate to us. So Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us your wisdom as we walk through this parable, as we seek to learn from your wisdom, that we might grow and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Could remember no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy. We stood neath the death we could never 
If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to turn with me now to Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This morning's parable starts in a familiar fashion. When it, with the words, and again, once more stressing that it wasn't uncommon for Jesus to teach in parables. And in fact, if you read through all of the Gospels and counted every time Jesus shared a parable in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would find 46 separate occasions where Jesus taught in parables. And it would probably be fair to say, just as the Gospels didn't record every single time Jesus sat down to a dinner, it's just as likely that the Bible hasn't recorded every single parable Jesus taught either. A principle emphasized at the end of the book of John, where John wrote that had every single thing Christ had personally done on his, during his ministry on the earth had been recorded, the world itself couldn't hold enough books to contain the stories. So here we have, yet again, another occasion where Jesus is seen sharing a parable. And once again, he is sharing this parable with a purpose. As he expresses, as he does in several of his other parables, what the kingdom of heaven will be like. So let's start at the beginning of this parable together. As I mentioned earlier, this isn't just any wedding. This is a royal wedding. As the king's own son is becoming married. And as you can imagine, a wedding feast that a king would prepare for his own son, the future king and queen, would be a feast and all feasts. Every measure would be taken to ensure that this was the social event of the century and was definitely not something to be missed. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, it wasn't uncommon for regular wedding feasts to last an entire week, and yet when it came to royal wedding feasts, the party could last an entire month. Four weeks of extravagant food and drink, the best meals, the best company, the absolute best the king himself had to offer. Simply put, to the original audience listening to Christ's parable, such a wedding feast would have been the greatest festivity imaginable, given and prepared by the greatest monarch imaginable. 
from the most honored and highly respected guests imaginable. And those personally invited would have been the most prestigious, privileged assembly of people amongst the entire kingdom. Who wouldn't want to be included and personally attend such a party? Well, apparently there was a bunch of people who just couldn't be bothered. A wedding of this magnitude didn't happen overnight and that the king's servants were sent out to call those who had been earlier invited would indicate that those invited shouldn't have been caught off guard either. They had already been invited and given ample forewarning that this tremendous feast was to take place and they could get all their affairs in order before attending such a feast. And to be pre-invited to a royal wedding, having to made the short list, if you will, considering that you would be uh, personally selected to attend such a celebration beforehand, one's inclusion amongst this royal wedding bank would have been amongst the highest possible honors of the entire nation. And still, those who had been invited to a party refused to come. And at this point, again, that familiar twist raises its head. And those listening to Christ speaking would have thought to themselves or even said out loud to one another, how ridiculous, who would do such a thing? Who wouldn't want to be invited and attend such a once in a lifetime awesome celebration? One that features the finest food and most prestigious company in the land. How could you say no? In verse four, Christ continues to share how the king wasn't prepared to give up just yet. And after the initial denial, he sent out yet further servants to now plead with those invited to attend the feast and reconsider their decision to stay at home. And this second group of servants were largely met with indifference. Some who were invited, were told, went their own way, continuing on with their lives as though nothing special was taking place. One went back to the farm, another to his business, and it simply appeared that those invited to this extravagant wedding feast just weren't all that interested in attending. But then another group did take action, but not the type of action one would expect. These people, who had graciously received a royal wedding banquet invitation, when they were approached a second time, they seized the king's servants, treated them shamefully, and then murdered them. Contempt for the king's servants could be construed as a contempt for the king himself. And this ignorant and blatant mistreatment of the king's servant was arguably a flat out, bold, and violent act of rebellion, largely directed at the king himself. Now let's pause here for a moment to reflect upon who the central characters of this parable represent. Considering that Jesus introduced this parable as being about the kingdom of heaven, I believe that we can confidently conclude that the king in this parable represents God. So, who then are the invited guests? Historically speaking, the invited guests represent the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Now, consider the climate in which Jesus originally presented this parable. Many in attendance of his teaching would already be familiar with their past family history and Jewish heritage. Generations earlier, God had called his chosen people through Israel's patriarch Abraham, and as a result of this calling and the ensuing covenant God made with Abraham, Abraham's descendants would be blessed. And as we learn from our recent walk through the book of Genesis, as such, Abraham's family, the future Israelites, would in turn become a blessing to the rest of the world. But over the course of several generations, even though the nation of Israel faced much difficulty and hardships, largely on account of their own stubbornness and independence, mind you, many Israelites considered themselves far superior to anyone else. After all, God chose them. God promised to bless them. They were the privileged few, they were the invited ones. And what they have been invited to was the incredible, incomparable blessing of God. 
which we lived out not just for a one-month feast, but for all of eternity in heaven. And this unique celebration would be initiated by the eventual coming of a Messiah, an occasion that would be marked by a great banquet given for the very people he would come to save, and that being in their minds, Israel. And with that, we should soundly conclude that the king of this parable is God. And those invited to the wedding banquet represent the nation of Israel. Now, at first glance, you might question, well, this parable doesn't represent God very favorably, does it? But to do so, we'd only be looking at the king's reaction in isolation and not looking at the big picture story of Jesus' parable. If God was the king, and those invited to the wedding banquet were Israel. Any suggestions as to whom the king's servants who sent out the invites represented? Well, who throughout history, who acted on the behalf of God to invite people into their master's presence? John the Baptist? Jesus himself? Both Old and New Testament prophets, apostles, preachers, teachers. In his study of this particular passage, modern theologian John MacArthur offered that God was saying to Israel, his already invited guests, much the same as he had said from heaven at Jesus' baptism. Here is my son. Come and give him honor. But John the Baptist was rejected, and beheaded. Jesus was rejected and crucified. And the apostles and prophets to follow were rejected and persecuted too, many being put to death. We could argue that these guests who rejected the king's invitation to this day are not just the people of Israel, but anyone who is caught up in their own independent personal pursuits as they are more concerned about the present than they are with their future. They may not have any personal interest in spiritual things, or they may simply think there are to be future opportunities farther down the road, other possible wedding places, banquets to take place. And now was just simply not the time. Their life was too busy, their schedule too full to even be bothered. And then Those who seized the king's servants and killed them? They should be understood to be people who are completely opposed to both the king and his agenda, as they seemingly sought to serve an agenda all of their own. It wasn't enough for them to simply decline the banquet invitation. Instead, they first humiliated the king's servants, and then they ultimately eliminated these servants are becoming able to invite any further wedding guests too. So we can readily conclude that these men represented those who are opposed to the gospel, as they appeared intent upon not just personally avoiding the king, but steering others in a complete opposite direction too. In the days of the early Christian church, there would be a lot of of opposition to the apostles' efforts to share of the love of Jesus Christ. And much of this opposition took shape in the form of false religions or those trying to promote their own better way of living, spiritual or otherwise. Some might argue that the first group of servants represented John the Baptist and the second group of servants represented Jesus Christ, but we can't ignore that both men died. And as we see in a moment, God didn't stop inviting people to the royal wedding banquet either. Even after the second group of servants were killed. So while we can conclude that all of these servants were intent upon serving their master, particularly for the third group who had seen those before them murdered for such an endeavor, all of the king's servants were committed to serving their master by attempting to gather those the king had invited to attend this tremendous feast. And instead of trying to place a precise identity upon these servants mentioned here, probably, actually, too numerous to mention, perhaps the bigger message to take home from these two separate missions of the king's servants 
calling upon those who had been invited, is the illustration of God's gracious patience, his great desire to not give up, and his willingness to repeatedly invite people into a glorious celebration. As we see illustrated here and throughout history, God's willingness to call Israel and others to a repentance which grants them entrance into the party again and again and again. First, by sending John the Baptist, then by sending Jesus Christ, then with the apostles, followed by further prophets and preachers and teachers, right up to this very day. But if the first half of this parable is straightforward, the latter half of the parable is anything but, and has caused a great deal of confusion to those who simply give it a passing glance. The king responded to those who killed his servants with anger, and he punished them accordingly, sending out troops to destroy both them and their cities. God is a patient God, but his patience does have its limit, particularly when it involves others trying to prevent those he has invited from attending a glorious banquet he has prepared. But the king still had a wedding feast set up and ready to go. So what does he do after those who opposed him were killed? Matthew 22 verse 8 then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited, they were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So of those the king had originally invited was the nation of Israel. Then who is this next group of people that are being invited? Well, simply speaking, it's everyone else, including us, all people, good and bad. And there's a couple of things that I'd offer we should take note of here in the verses we just read. First off, the king offers that those invited were not worthy. But this unworthiness should not be confused to be or understood that they lacked sufficient righteousness, else we think that we need to earn our way into heaven, which none of us will ever be truly worthy. Some translations read that those invited earlier did not deserve the honor. But the truth of the matter is, the original invitations were never based upon merit, but entirely upon the king's gracious favor. It was his party, a celebration of the wedding of his own son. And the invitation list was his to compile. Those invited earlier did not earn their invitation so much as they were given it. And they ultimately refused entry because they refused an invitation that was no way based upon any measure of their own worth. They were invited and yet by their own choice, they opted to decline. With such a principle in mind, we can argue that an individual's own personal salvation is too, is not based upon any sort of human goodness or religious or spiritual accomplishment either. But at the end of the day, it boils down to whether one personally desires to accept God's invitation to receive his son, Jesus Christ. Whether they will personally accept that invitation or reject it. So much in the same manner of the Great Commission, the king instructs his servants to go out into the main roads and invite as many people to the wedding feast as they could find. And the banquet hall soon became filled with guests. We're told they were both good and bad. Again, none of them worthy of the invitation, but their attendance entirely depended upon the king's good favor. But when the king enters the hall to observe those in attendance, he discovers someone not dressed properly for an event of such magnitude. And after the king is given no response to his question, how was this man granted entrance without a wedding garment? The man was bound and tied and tossed out of the party. So what's the deal here? We can sensibly understand the king's anger with those who had humiliated and murdered his servants, but is this some form of an ego trip? 
Why would the king treat this man so harshly with his only fault seeming to be that he wasn't properly dressed for the occasion? And yet again, we would do ourselves a great favor by asking of ourselves, what is being illustrated here in a parable whose story is thought to illustrate what the kingdom of heaven will be like? What element of the kingdom is this man's rejection referring to? Where this man is judged harshly for not attending the banquet in the proper attire? And what might that mean in regards to the kingdom of heaven? Now those in attendance of the banquet are labeled both good and bad. And yet it is just this one man who is singled out. Again, as before, none could be categorized as worthy enough to attend this banquet. What caused this particular man to be outright dismissed entirely? And what does his lack of a wedding garment serve to represent? Some biblical scholars have suggested that for a feast of such magnitude, the king wouldn't have invited people that would have no means to provide for themselves the proper wedding attire to attend. After all, the king had sent his servants out into the streets to invite people to the banquet. Certainly some of those invited wouldn't even have had any proper wedding clothes in their closet, or if they were traveling, they might have left them at home. And once again, it bears repeating that Christ's parables are blunt and to the point, lacking a lot of descriptive detail. But would it be too outrageous to assume that the king instructed his servants to invite as many people as they could find, that the king's servants weren't solely seeking qualified people, those with affluence who could afford a proper wedding garment, but that they invited everyone and possibly maybe even provided wedding garments to those who couldn't provide the proper attire for themselves. I mean, to this day, there are many exclusive restaurants who require a jacket and tie, and they have the ability to provide the proper attire to those who show up unprepared. So how crazy would it be to assume that the king might have also provided the proper attire for this wedding banquet and its guests? Because otherwise, it would have been cruel for the king's servants to approach someone on the street and say, you're invited to the wedding banquet, but only if you can come up with the proper clothes. If not, you might as well stay at home. You're out of luck. Which could stand to reason why the king reacted so harshly. Could it be possible that the king invited all these people and provided the proper clothes for those who needed it, and yet he had found someone at the banquet who had ignored his offering, someone who instead chose to attend the banquet entirely upon his own terms, rejecting both the king's wishes and the gift that he had provided to them. There may have been someone at the door offering wedding robes to those who arrived unprepared. And when this man approached, he looked at what he was wearing and thought his attire was good enough and refused to wear the robe being offered to him. Because he wanted to be unique, an individual. He didn't want to be like everyone else. He wanted to be his own person. But a proper wedding garment appeared to be a prerequisite for entry. As the king even asked the man how he got into the banquet dressed the way he was. And the man was speechless, offering for himself no defense. He didn't say, I can't afford the proper wedding garment. He didn't offer, I forgot it at home or my wedding garments at the cleaners. He didn't offer any excuse at all. A proper and respectable wedding garment would have been naturally expected for one's attendance at a wedding banquet, particularly a royal wedding banquet. But this man seemingly chose to ignore such demands and inevitably cost him his opportunity to be a part of this glorious celebration. So as we begin to wrap up today, I personally believe that God continues to send out his servants to graciously invite those both evil and good to attend his son's impending wedding banquet. But yet, there is a something you need to do in order to be gained entrance. And that's follow in obedience.
That's do what is asked of you. And when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, that means repenting of your sin and turning to God for forgiveness. And if you've heard such an invitation, may I ask those of you watching today, what have you done in response? Do you continue about your ways, return back to work, or conclude that there will be more banquets to come? And the timing is just not right at this moment? Or do you maybe accept the invitation, but choose that the person you are, what you are wearing, doesn't have to change? And that the king just needs to accept you as you are, dirty sneakers and all. The good news of Jesus Christ has gone out across this globe far and wide throughout all of human history. God's messengers have invited countless people to their master's tremendous wedding banquet. And ever since Jesus returned back to his father's side in heaven, he has been awaiting a time when he will indeed return and the doors to the banquet will become opened. But Christ concludes this parable with the words, For many are called, but few are chosen. For while the invitations to this ultimate wedding have gone out to many, only a few of those who heard the call will be willing to accept what is being offered to them, and thereby be among God's chosen. Those who will join in the king's celebratory banquet. The gospel invitation is one that is free and it is sent out to everyone because it is God's desire that not a single person be excluded from entering into the kingdom of heaven. But sadly, not everyone wants God with the same passion that he lovingly possesses for them. Because at the end of the day, God's grace is available to all, but all are not humble enough to accept it. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me. Who 
Looking upon the service, one might think that the king from this week's parable rejected the guest because of what he was wearing. When arguably what he was more concerned about was the guest's independent and prideful spirit. May we now close our study in prayer today, asking that the Spirit help us to humble our hearts and accept the Lord's gracious invitation as we become willing to come to the party under His own terms and not our own. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that You have invited us to come join with You for a party that will last into all of eternity. But Lord, while that invitation goes out to all, not all will accept it and receive it. And in fact, there will be those who will be opposed to it and treat those who share the message harshly. Lord, I thank you that you have offered to us this invitation, even though we are not worthy, even though we do not deserve it. But Lord, may our own heads not become too big. May we not become too filled with pride because we have been invited to such a glorious banquet. But Lord, may we humble ourselves. May we repent. May we not be content to be the sinful people that we are, but Lord, may we approach you and ask for your forgiveness and ask the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts so that we might become changed, so that we might cast aside this fallen sinful self and Lord don these wedding garments don a new self that is made in you Lord pray that we would be strong pray that we would be humble pray that we would be accepting of all that you have to offer to us and put aside our own agenda so that we can in all things follow and obey you In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for Worship Online here this week as we reviewed perhaps the most challenging parable to date. But next week should be able to join us here online or in person for our weekly worship service in Petawal where we'll be exploring yet another, maybe even more difficult parable. One in which a wealthy man commends a past employee for utilizing some questionable business practices. So until next time, may you experience God's peace wherever you might find yourself this week. As I invite God's blessings upon you all. And bye for now.